Where am I? No answer. Boxes of clutter have gone off to the Helen and Douglas House charity shop. Was I in one of them? I go along to check. I see myself displayed in their window with a price tag on my toe. Two pounds. <laughs> Apparently I've been there for a long time, accumulating dust. Well, I'm a Gemini and a sucker for a bargain. I go in and pay the asking price for my other half. Delighted that after 80 years, I managed to get myself together. <laughs> Please welcome Peggy Sinder. If I had wings like 
in eight minutes. <laughs> 152 jalapenos, that's like seven pounds in weight, in 15 minutes. Hey, you can sit in the front row anytime. <laughs> and here's a quote from him. He said, it's fascinating to know you're the best in the world at something. <laughs> I'm not good at surfing or skiing, but I am good at jalapeno eating. God gave me that talent. <laughs> now, we can't laugh at people like that because there's a lot of folks who go wrong to just look at him doing that. But work. <laughs> You don't have to hit that. 
hit the subject on the head with a hammer to make the message go through. There's some wonderful, very short songs. And I don't mean things like, Donald's in the White House with his bunch of tricks. Donald's in the White House with his bunch of pretty diabetes <laughs> dealers at his second home. To think that they are dangerous is just a lot of balderdash and nonsense. What Donald doesn't want is sharing what he's got with a lot of other countries that are Muslim. <laughs> or just down on their luck. So Donald's in the White House to tell them all to funny how we are that he's going to lose. But now he's in the White House, I guess he's going to screw the people, screw the climate, screw the earth, and then make the world a safer place for Yankee businessmen. Now that's short. <laughs> now here's a little one by Bob Boston, who lives out in Vancouver. Now try writing a short political song. You really have every word matters. Every article, every noun, every, it all has to be in place. And everything's in place in this one, even though it was written about 40 years ago when they didn't have quite the kind of weapons we have now. Hush now, little baby, Sandman's strolling near. Nobody's gonna harm you, Dad will be right here. And Daddy's got a 38, he's got an M16. He's got a 12-gauge shotgun and a Thompson submachine, a Magnum and a Mauser and a stash of TNT. Nobody's gonna harm you. Hush now, go to sleep. Bye, boss. <laughs> I gave down in Asheville, North Carolina. A friend of mine came up. She says, Peggy, I'm tired. He says, your songs have so many words in them. <laughs> and this is one of those songs. <laughs> <laughs> Ground is covered with towns and 
sense how much mistake Man believes the world is his, he's uncreated by creation. Do you want me to hand this to an audience member and get them to read it out? Do you need some family mediation there? Do you? <laughs> My God, it'll be another Brexit. <laughs> no, I've lost, I've lost it. No. <laughs> so, um, I was making jam in my kitchen with Martin Carthy, yeah. which is my favourite name drop ever. <laughs> And uh, it was Damson, if you're interested. Uh, we were on either side of it, stirring and picking out the pips, and we completely lost track and overcooked the jam. It was like sort of rock. It was building material by the time we finished. Anyway, while we were doing it, he sang me this song, which I'd never heard. Apparently quite a few people know it, but I didn't. It's by Mike Waterson. And... Um, there's a bit of a story behind it. Uh, the first part of the story is he saw a cartoon, a line drawing cartoon in a newspaper. And it's, um, it's the side of a factory, blobs of sugar mill, and underneath that is guaranteed untouched by human hand. And down below there are a load of gorillas on bicycles moving their shift. Uh, the next part of the story is Mike was on a, a long haul flight um, on a plane and he said, don't have a cup of tea. He certainly said, would you like some milk? Yeah, I'll have some milk. And they brought him these little, you know, the little plastic pots of milk. Um, and on the top was, it said, milk from Honeypot Farms, guaranteed non-dairy product. <laughs> and the third part of the story is, he was at a uh, uh, folk festival. He was backstage and catering and he went up to the counter and said, can I have a cup of tea, please? And the woman just pointed at the drinks machine. Um, I think it's called Tea's Made. <laughs> da, da, da. I went to an all-night cafe as the sun began to rise and I saw a fair maid standing there salt tears in her eyes oh why do you weep fair maiden she gave a little sob oh thank you kind sir for asking i lost my bloody job i was a waitress in this cafe and i worked both hard and keen but i got the sack stabbed in the back by a sodding drinks machine you put your money in the top a light comes on below. You press for tea and coffee comes. 
you know how these things go. And the milk comes in small sachets that you can't get in no how. And it smells of burnt plastic and it's never seen a cow. And gorillas pack the sugar in a factory fine and grand. And it's guaranteed hygienic and untouched by human hand. So do not use this cafe. Join the picket line with me. Then they'll have to find some robots who will drink their fucking tea. <laughs> When does John Green come to? Does he? Okay. <coughs> Do you know? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> he was a famous person in a ballad who's just been moved. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my fault though. <laughs> We totally cocked the whole gig up. She's <laughs> <laughs> angling to do it again. Did we really fuck the whole thing up? <laughs> Don't have a flight past me. Kelso will probably never recover. <laughs> Thousand games. 
Blizzards and gales Endless drawings Countless sketches On my window pane Master craftsman Skilled engraver Jack Frost is his name Wait until our baby's born and 
from about the mid 60s to about the mid 70s. The total collection has, I think, 350 songs in it, new songs at the time. This one was sent in to me on a cassette. And you young folks remember, don't even know what cassettes were, I guess, for you. And they're 40. <laughs> <laughs> sent in by a woman named Muriel Hogan, who just gone on third shift in America. The terms of payment come back, come from the 1960s. It's called 30, thir third shift which is night shift. I got it together, but not quite out into the weather. It's a cold night for most of the city. It's cold and bed when I'm shaking the office. Out of my head, I'm working the third shift. I guess it's all right, I better get pushing. It's midnight when I started working. The first night I thought I'd be lonesome. But I wasn't right, the people on my shift. They're friendly and strong, they're steady as heartbeats. Going all night long, you watch those old times. They really know how to make it on their shift. I'm saving right now. You know we get an extra 27 cents an hour for these good hours we keep. While the president and his whole board of directors are making plenty more money. says the same thing. It's a wonderful thing. You're changing a visual into an audio. And I did that um, with, with this one. Before, but before I read it, let's have a C chord just to see how your memories work. <laughs> <laughs> the dawn of what is known as civilization, we've organized as tribes, then as nations. Then we choose an emblem, a fauna, or a flora to put on flags and totem poles to represent our aura. England chose the red rose. It's passionate and regal. Scotland chose the thistle, the USA, the eagle. Now the eagle, as our symbol, is very fitting, very right. It swoops around the world, devouring everything in sight. <laughs> but Washington announced today, the eagle's got to go, because there's a better image, one that's far more apropos. The condom. <laughs> the condom best reflects the Yankee stance. It accommodates inflation in our symbolic pants. <laughs> it discourages our urges by diminishing gratification. It removes the possibility of following generations. It protects a bunch of pricks. <laughs> and if I may be so crude, we think we're safe, but we're really being screwed. <laughs> I'm not sure. 
<laughs> this is probably from the mid 90s. Um, I collected the things in this book uh, over a period of about 25 years, and some of them are absolutely crazy. Um, uh, some of them are, are really interesting. He who drinks gets drunk. He who gets drunk goes to sleep. He who goes to sleep does not sin. He who does not sin goes to heaven. So let's all drink and go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. It's wonderful. I seem to remember there was one on page 20 here. So yeah. It is important that a man helps you around the house and has a job. It is important that a man makes you laugh. It is important to find a man you can count on and doesn't lie to you. It is important that a man loves you and spoils you. It is important that these four men don't know each other. <laughs> Harvard University uh, wrote a paper called The Global Burden of Disease. And here's one sentence from it 25 years ago. Globally, men's violence against women causes more deaths and disabilities among females aged 50 to 44 than cancer, malaria, traffic accidents, or war. I think I'll try to. Though he was made from Adam's rib, nine months he lay within her crib. How can a man of woman born thereafter use her sex with scorn? For though we bear the human race, to us is given but second place, and some men place us lower still by using us against our will. If we choose to walk alone, for us there is no safety zone. If we're attacked, we bear the blame. They say that we began the game. And though you prove your injury, the judge may set the rapist free. Therefore, the victim is to blame. Call it nature. But rapes the name. Husbands may think they have the right to take their wife whenever they like, but courts uphold time after time that rape in marriage is a crime. The choice is hers and hers alone, but she may lose her kids and home. When law becomes a legal claim, call it duty, but rates the name. And if a man should rape a child, is it because his spirit's wild? Our system gives the prize to all who trample on the weak and small. When fathers rape, they surely know their kids have nowhere else to go. Try to forget, don't ask us to forgive them. They know what they do. We claim the night and win the day. We want the right that should be our own. A freedom women have seldom known. The right to live, the right to walk alone without fear. When exploitation is the norm, rape is found in many forms. Lower wages, meaner tasks, poorer schooling, second class. 
We serve our own and like the men we serve employers. It follows then that body's rate is nothing new, but just the servant's final due. We've raised our voices in the past, and this time will not be the last. Our body's gift is ours to give, not payment for the right to live. Since we reject the status quo, we claim the right to answer no. If without consent he stake a claim, call it rape, for rape's the name. We claim the night and win the day. We want the right that should be our own, a freedom women have seldom known. The right to live, the right to walk alone without fear. Yes, so what's it got to do with you? So close your 
certain songs like ballads, you can just sing them over and over and over and you're telling yourself a story and the song is so well made that you have different thoughts and different ideas while, while you're singing it. And this is one of my, I think I sing this most every day at home. It's a song made by Don Lang. Look him up, L-A-N-G-E. It's just, small incidents from his own childhood. It's called Here's to You Rounders. I never knew my granddad that he was always on the bum Every September Me and my brother would get a few coins in the mail. We couldn't spend them, they were all he could send from out of Mexico City Jail. Now, back in the thirties, when the going got rough. Oh, granddad, he hit the road. Mother was young then, she only remembers his name. Then granny got work in the old canyon factory and she took in some wash on the side. Promised herself she'd never forgive him, I promise. She kept till she died. So here's to your rounders and here's to your railroad bonds. I hope that you make it home soon. And here's to the women who marry for love and live with the man in the moon. Oh, here's to your
because the fellow lives out in Madison, Wisconsin, the home of beer, cheese, and snow. And his name is Peter Berryman. Look him up, see if you can find some of his songs. I want his brain saved for posterity. He writes the craziest songs, and I love them all. And this is one of them. a recent contest for new scientific theories. Uh, there were a lot of entries. And there was a, I'm going to read you the first runner-up, and then I'm going to read you the winner. New scientific theories. If an infinite number of rednecks riding in an infinite number of pickup trucks fire an infinite number of shotgun rounds at an infinite number of highway signs, they will eventually produce all the world's great literary works in Braille. By the whole squad. But the grand prize winner was, when a cat is dropped, it always lands on its feet. And when toast is dropped, it always lands with the buttered side facing down. Therefore, said the grand prize winner, I propose to strap buttered toast to the back of a cat. <laughs> when dropped, the two will hover, spinning inches above the ground, probably into eternity. A buttered cat array could replace pneumatic tires on cars and trucks. And giant buttered cat arrays could easily allow a high-speed monorail linking New York with Chicago. Now, what 
does that have to do with the next song? Absolutely not. <laughs> Hit my memoir. <laughs> is a father better than a mother? Is a sister better than a brother? One's concave, one's convex. Does that make one sex better than the other? Ajax shoulders move boulders. Helen's hips launch ships. Opposites favor. Their opposites nature. Adam and Eve are fish and chips. Now the world needs us. So the world breeds us from the ant and the elephant to the little rhesus monkey. Every creature from the anteater to the mooses has its uses. Now a dog don't sing and a bird don't bark. So which is the best thing, a poodle or a lark? Now it's ridiculous comparing one who's prickless to one who's hairy. <laughs> is black better than white, day better than night? Without either, there'd be neither. Now some women try to be she-men, then say that he-men's are worse than demons. Nature gives us equal chances, and to get on, shouldn't have to wear pants. We're not like moles or does or rabbits. We should control on social habits and things that turn us against each other and don't learn us to be sister and brother. But since her and him are indispensable, treating them similar is only sensible. Reason shows us the logical sequel. We're different, therefore equal. Mm -hmm. going to sing a really very unusual song to me, totally unusual. And you figure out why do people write the songs that they write? And I figure it's because we have to. We want to create something. And things just come out of the woodwork, out of the cement, out of everywhere with people writing songs. And this is one that ha this has happened to me. Uh, my vehicle in America was called Maggie, and uh, this is a story that Maggie and I went through in California about songwriting. I was steaming up California State Route 1, the fabled coastal highway that runs up the west coast of the El Dorado State. Post that woman, Monica Lewinsky, I heard someone call it the Kinky Prick State. Florida has long been called the penis of America, pointing down, aimed at Cuba, waiting for stimulus. <laughs> Busy songwriting in my head, I didn't watch the speedometer. Blue lights, blue lights, blue lights. I steer Maggie onto the shoulder. A handsome young policeman sticks his head in the window and asks if I know how fast I was going. My Maggie could indeed gallop at full tilt. I admit that I only glanced at the speedometer when I saw the blue lights. 95 miles per hour on a 65 mile per hour road. No, officer, I'm a musician and I'm very sorry I was writing a song in my head and I just wasn't paying attention and his face lights up. I write songs too, he said. What's your song about? Off we went, commiserating on the difficulties of putting thoughts and emotions into verse and melody. You play pop music? Do you know Bobby Dylan and Joni Baez? He was impressed that before they were Bobby and Joni, they both asked for my autograph. But he zipped back to our songs. He just wanted some tips. He let me off with a warning. That's official, don't 
that customs officer at Heathrow, who every time I turned up carrying my guitar case, would ask me in hushed tones if it was the 1907 Martin. <laughs> I tour with no other, and he knows it. We swing into our routine. I open the case, and he takes it out reverently and plays it. The other officials are busy stopping anyone with a brown or black skin. <laughs> and this is our Joe, our Joe Garcia, who, who dances. Go on. Give me a huge round of applause. He's doing the same. <laughs> And the more embarrassed you will be. Yeah. 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 You could you could make toast on his face. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I don't think this song is that unusual. I think it's actually um, not as unusual as almost everything you've been singing tonight. But you know, hey, that's just me. Uh, this is someone I've, my mum asked me to sing some songs on this. Just going back to what I was saying at the beginning, we are all ages that we have ever been. When mum asks me to sing on her tour, I revert to my 16-year-old terrified self quite often. Well, I used to, I don't so much now actually. Because I've been a guitarist all my life. Um, and don't really get up and sing in front of people. I'm not asking for a sympathy here, I've still got to do it well. You're getting it anyway. Uh, <laughs> What was that? I've completely digressed. From, that's the trouble with not planning what you're going to say all the time. Anyway, yes, when I got together with my now wife, Kate, she was working, um, she's a musician too, she was working with another Kate, Kate McGarrigal. And um, it turned out that this was Kate McGarrigal's last gig. And um, she performed this song at the gig, and I'd always loved it. And uh, so I learned it and then changed a lot of it because it was a bit too American, which is really cheeky, so if anybody knows the Canadian. songs that Kate McGarrigle... She's Canadian. Well, all right. But, <laughs> she is, but she actually sings song, sings lines in it like the, the, the boulevards of old Mexico, Gosh. which is technically a kind of American because it's Latin America. Yeah, so sense. I've changed it from the Americas to a more Anglophile. Will that help? Oh God, I won't stop them. This is a total mess now. Fuck <laughs> <laughs> it, I'm English. I can do what I want. It's, I'm singing it. We'll talk about 
I learned loads of stuff that I didn't know. <laughs> so just imagine how much you'll learn that you don't know. Uh, oh, it's just going on. Sorry, Neil. Yeah. I can tell I'm straight now. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Sorry, Neil. I was always wandering off somewhere, a tendency that can lead to a variety of interesting results. In 1948, I wandered off in Landsborough's department store in Washington, and a tall, calm, very black woman found me and stayed with me till my mother, Dio, came, Elizabeth Cotton. Penny nicknamed her Libba, and the name stuck. She and Dio stuck up a friendship immediately. I loved Libba and for five years she came to us on Saturdays. The family guitar was hung on a wall in the kitchen. I came in after school one day and found Libba playing it left-handed, index finger swinging away doing the job of the thumb, her thumb relegated to fingerdom. And then we heard freight train for the first time. Mike and I learned to play it left-handed and Libba became a major centre of attention. She dragged songs out of her childhood, polished them up and sang them on Saturdays. A church in North Carolina had deemed guitar playing unsuitable for a married woman, so a girl bride, Libba had laid the instrument down by the riverside. Well, the Lord is fond of second comings, and Libba picked up the guitar once more in a Chevy Chase kitchen, and she damn well wasn't going to lay it down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> from my mum when I was about 10. Uh, I visited her when I was 16 and I played her this tune and she told me I wasn't playing it right, but we're going to do it anyway. And sing along to it, because I know you know it.
of the evening. Oh. You just did that because you had to. <laughs> wow. And it came about in a strange way. There's a wonderful DJ, folk DJ, named Susan Hanson Forbes in America. And uh, she ran a wonderful folk program for 20, 25 years. I was living in Boston at the time, and her program was down in Rhode Island. And she said, Peggy, can I come and visit you? So I said, yeah, sure, come through. And she was shattered. After 25 years, she had been told, your program's over. Just like that. And it was who she was. And she was an incredible woman for just finding. It's a bit like you, Fiona. She just knew where to get, get things. And she said on the way to visiting me, she had gone by her old family home and found that it had been completely, all the trees had been cut down and there were big buildings around it. And she was heartbroken, you know. And I said, that's where the song, uh, Susan said. And, uh, so I got an idea for the song, and then all of a sudden, while I was writing it, I found that it was a song about my mother, not a song about the place I had been brought up in, which is still roughly the same as when I grew up. So this is with ideas from Susan Forbes Hansen's life and, and my life as well. And uh, my mother is Ruth Croft, was Ruth Crawford Seeger, I would like you to look her up on the internet. Extraordinary woman. Composer, now known as the major female composer of modernist music of the 1900s, Ruth Crawford Seeger. <laughs>
Actually, Norma Watterson um, knows uh, traveled with the, the Watersons for a while at one point. She says, my knees are not going to do this, just bowing and walking off lines. She said, well, we're just going to do our encore now. <laughs> Wonderful. Love Norma. Uh, so Neil's going to sing a song that is very hard for our family to sing. It was Ewan McCall's goodbye song called The Joy of Living. Uh, Ewan and I were in a, a period of listening to Sicilian songs at the time this was written. And each of us wrote um, some songs to um, Sicilian tunes. So the tune of this is a Sicilian one or it's a, a, a slight remake of it. And he was a mountain walker. He loved, his favorite was Sullivan yes. and Stat Polly. And he was a real walker. I mean, just ran up the mountains when I first met him. But this happened, I think it would be when he was about 68, 67. And Kitty, my, my daughter, and I were out walking with him. And we started up Stack Polly with you, and I knew I couldn't make it. He couldn't make it for the first time. He just, he just. So he paced around the bottom, and during that time, by the time we came down, he had this song written, and it's called "The Joy of Living." Thank you. 
Mary's room at 43, the truth goes on.